Um, I was just going to say, basically, um, oh, why is that doing it like that? I'm assuming that most of you, because you, most of you are community groups or educators in some form, that you are going out there and talking to people. Um, so these slides are basically something I've created for, for Joe Public. So it's talking to everybody about reuse and repair. So what I'll do at the end is send these to Claire and she can send them to you and then you can use the slides if you want. Um, so you can use them as they are, you can tweak them, or if you really don't like the format, but there's bits in there that you like, take them out and use them. So we're not precious about this. You don't have to do things exactly the way I'm doing it. But the idea is that we're hoping that you're going to go out and cascade these messages. So if I take you through this, then hopefully you'll go out and tell another 10, 20, 30 people about it. And that way we'll get out to, to more and more people across Scotland. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that's the right approach and that's, uh, that's what you're expecting. Um, but you might learn something new yourselves as well today. Uh, but this is just a presentation. I've, I've done it quite a few times now with, with a lot of people. Um, and I found that actually the majority really haven't considered a, a lot of these things. It's just getting people to think about um, ways they can reuse and reduce um, their waste. So um, as I say, obviously this slide you would need to take out if you're delivering this to the public, but the majority of them are applicable to everybody. So it's just going to go through a very quick intro about Zero Waste Scotland in case you haven't come across us before. And then a little bit about reuse. What do we mean by reuse? Because we find people really get reuse and recycling kind of confused or um, they think they're the same thing, really, which it doesn't matter what they call it as long as they're doing the right things. Um, but it's just sort of making sure that we're, we're stressing reuse as opposed to recycling. Um, stressing why we should bother and the most important thing, what can we actually do? So, oops, is that moving on? Yeah. Okay, so Zero Waste Scotland basically exists to create a society where resources are valued and nothing is wasted. So we're conscious, you know, that we're running out of resources um, and we really need to make sure that we are making the most of everything we've got and reusing it again and again and again wherever we can. Um, you've probably seen, if you haven't heard of us necessarily, you've probably seen some of the brands we work with. So Love Food Hate Waste is one of the ones you see the most, along with the Recycle for Scot Scotland Swoosh, because it's probably on all of your council communications. Um, but we also adapt that slightly when we talk about reuse, you're trying to promote donating, swapping, selling, buying, all those things. Um, for businesses, we have our energy efficiency business support service, um, and there's some really good stuff on their website. So even if you know, it's, it's business, but also community groups. So if you've got a building, then there's a lot of stuff they do that's applicable. There's stuff on there like the Green Champions training, which is free. So if anybody wants to sort of develop their knowledge about um, sort of different environmental things, then you can have a look at the Green Champions set up as well. Um, and it's an online thing, so you can dip in and out of it when you want to and do as much or as little as you want to. Um, and I put Love Your Clothes there. It's not a campaign we run ourselves, but we promote it because we were part of the, the team that sort of set it up in the first place. But it is now managed by an organisation in England. But it's a really good campaign all around reducing textile waste. So we're back to the, the business of reuse and why it's so important. Um, and I think this figure says it all, four fifths of the carbon footprint generated by Scotland comes from the products and materials we use. So, you know, people think, yeah, I've got to fly less, I've got to drive less, um, I've got to turn the heat, the lights off, all of this. A lot of people really don't realize that consumption is such a major, major problem. And we really need to think about that. Um, so that hence, that's why we are talking about this. Um, and I'm sure most of you know the waste hierarchy. So there we've got the best option at the top, prevention, then minimization, then reuse. And recycling is quite a long way down there. Um, so but when you talk to people about the environment, certainly at my mother's age and things like that, when I talk to my mum and say anything about the environment, she says, but I do my recycling. And yet 
yeah, that's great. That's really good. Recycling is fantastic. But is there something better you could be doing? So it's just getting people to realise that there is an option that is better than recycling. Um, so that's what this is all about. And at a very basic level, I tend to talk to people just to really stress what reuse is, get them to consider just a piece of paper. So what is reuse with a bit of paper? Well, it's using the other side. So yeah, I've got one thing on, I don't know if you can see any bit here. Yeah, I've got one thing on one side and I've used both sides. It's a real simple, basic thing, but that is reuse. So my husband gets really hacked off me because I've got a massive stash of scrap paper in the uh, office. Um, but I'm like, no, it's only been used on one side. I've got to use the other side. And whenever he's trying to empty a folder and throw any papers away, I go through every single bit of paper. And if it's only used on one side, I keep it. Um, so that's reuse. Repair, obviously, if there's a tear or something, we're going to use some sellotape maybe to fix it. To upcycle it, we could turn it into a paper plane. Um, to recycle it, we turn it into new paper by some form of processing. So then just try to stress why the reuse option is so much better. Well, basically to reuse it, there is normally no cost, no energy involved at all. If we're repairing it, then maybe the some resources, skills and time may be required. If we're upcycling it again, there may be some resources, skill and time. If we're recycling it, yep, it saves resources, it saves virgin paper, but it still requires skills, time, money, energy to produce that new paper. And it can only actually be recycled five to seven times before the quality of the paper is too poor to be recycled. So again, I think that's something a lot of people don't think about, the fact that recycling is limited. You know, some things can be recycled infinitely, but a lot of things can't so it is much better if we can avoid that option um and just i know some of you have seen this but i love this this alternative to the uh, waste hierarchy the hierarchy of needs so using what you have the most environmental option is always using what you have so whenever i just finally sees people who want to buy green stuff they want to buy bamboo cutlery they want to buy something to be green you're like, no, you don't need bamboo cutlery. The greenest thing is the cutlery drawer that you've got in the kitchen, which is probably bursting to the seams with knives and forks that you could already be using. So it's just trying to stress these sort of options. So just to summarize, reuse is using it again in its original state or as close to it as possible. The problem is that cheaper production of stuff has meant things have become much more disposable. Um, and we found this great article from the 50s where they were celebrating that they created throwaway stuff because it was going to save the housewife 40 hours of cleaning. Uh, of course, in those days, it was the housewife. You know, it was certainly never going to be a man in the house doing it. Um, so excuse the, the uh, sexism here, but this is from the 50s, a different world. Uh, but yeah, they weren't really thinking about the impact in the future. They just thought this was a great thing. But of course, it has led to perfectly good stuff being buried in the ground. So just some sort of shocking stats, 60,000 reusable office desks that reckon go to landfill every year in Scotland. Uh, 125,000 reusable sofas, <coughs> excuse me. And with these, I think one of the big problems is that people cut off the fire labels and then they can't donate it for reuse. So again, really stressed to people, don't cut off that label. Unfortunately, some sofa manufacturers put them in really obvious visible places, which is really annoying, um, but if you can do something just to hide it, put a plant pot there or something, then that's better because you want that sofa to be reusable. TVs, I don't think this is any surprise, huge numbers of TVs going to landfill because everybody wants the newest, slimmest, highest definition, newfangled TV, so they're getting thrown away. There are some things going on. There's a company um, who are taking old TVs and they're making something they call Glasgow. Um, which is like an aggregate from the old um, 
screens where they're, they're cutting it up so it makes a sort of decorative glass that you sometimes sort of see around statues and things like that and they can make coloured glass and all this trying to sort of use the old screens um, but there's only so much decorative glass people want so really if we could be avoiding quite so many TVs going to landfill that would be much much better and t-shirts a horrendous number um, and you know when you think about it, this equates to about probably three t-shirts per person for every single person in Scotland um, being thrown away every year. Um, and you can imagine that I'm always being given free t-shirts at running events and cycling events. Um, and you see even environmental campaigns often selling t-shirts. You've got to have the t-shirt to prove you are supporting this campaign. And I often think it's kind of missing the point because actually, you're trying to be environmentally friendly and then you're telling people to go and buy a t-shirt they probably don't need to promote that campaign so there's got to be better ways of promoting that campaign so my message with this one is always yeah if you are offered a t-shirt and you think you're not going to wear it actually say no um i was going to a hendu once and they got us all in fact i've got the t-shirt on today we had supergirl t-shirts if you can see that uh, but they wanted to print everybody's name on the back and have Katrine's Hindu. And I said, I have the T-shirt, but I'm not having the printing on the back because I want to be able to wear it again. Um, and they all thought I was right party pooper and were looking really hacked off with me. Um, but I'm still wearing my T-shirt and I haven't seen any of them wearing their T-shirts again. So I feel that it was justified and it was well worth it. Um, so it's worth just thinking about these things if you're thinking about creating t-shirts for events or campaigns. So that's kind of setting the scene. Um, I don't know if there's any questions as yet, but we're just going to then move on to kind of what we can do. Uh, not yet, Miriam, um, cool. but just a reminder just to pop your questions in the chat if you have any and we can, we can address these at, at the end or various points in Miriam's presentation. Okay, excellent. All right. So I'm going to go through kind of six key things that I think people could be doing um, to try and avoid waste and try and keep things higher up the waste hierarchy rather than the recycling. So the first one really is about buying second hand or even renting. Um, now, what I find is when you're delivering these workshops, when I've had feedback in the past, one of the things people often ask is, they want tips for where they can get these things near to them. So I would recommend if you're delivering a workshop like this, maybe try and tailor the links on here to local things, to so try and find local businesses, local shops that, um, that they, you can highlight. Um, or if you don't know of any, then throw it out to the group to whether they know of any in the area. Because you know, we, much as we like to think we're the experts, often the stuff out there, we don't know. Um, so by second hand, trying to encourage people to, to check out reuse and charity shops. Um, so I mentioned Revolve Reuse, which is a quality standard that um, we promote, which means that if you're going into a second hand shop, the idea is that it has gone through quite a rigorous process um, to make sure that um, their, all their standards are up to scratch, that their safety standards customer service, um, cleanliness, all these things have gone through a process. Um, and I think, actually, I think we've got Revolve Recycle uh, here, I think. Um, was it? I'm sure somebody from them was here who has gone through the process. Yeah, Chad was here, wasn't he? Chad, are you here? Yep, I'm here. Yeah. Yep. Um, so yeah, what did it, were you, you weren't there, were you, when you went through the Revolve process? No, uh, I think we're due to do it uh, this year to go through her again. <laughs> Aha, I'll see you got that pleasure. But yeah, is, is there anything you'd like to say about um, what, what it's kind of done to, to your business? Well, I, I mean, I've only been you know, with the organization since November, but the resources and the kind of online tools that they've just developed have been, you know, a godsend because, you know, um, somebody's going to all the work with all the guidance and so forth. And so just the plethora of resources, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel, basically, uh, from my point of view in the short term right now. Excellent. That's great. Thanks, Chad. Um, I've also highlighted, uh, just wanted to highlight 
So if you were in, in Angus, then it could be promoting the Forward Coupar Angus reuse shop. So I think, is there somebody on the call from Forward? Uh, Stuart, I think, was meant to be here. Are you here, Stuart? Hi, yes, I'm here. Oh, yeah, sorry, hi, yeah. it's all right. So I thought it'd be the shop. first of the day that was on mute when I was trying to speak. You know what I mean? <laughs> so that's a prize, apparently. But it's not a T-shirt with a name on it. So you know what I mean? I'll take a T-shirt, but without a name. Thank you. Um, uh, yes, we have got a charity. Sorry, we have got sorry, a reuse shop. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a subtle difference between a charity shop and a reuse shop, which you know, I'm new, like Chad, to the development trust as development officer and um we kick off again on the 26th of uh, april with the reuse shop which is obviously exciting um but we let it out weekly to the community groups as well so basically we kill you know two birds with one stone and we allow community groups to collect through the reuse shop to support their um, individual initiatives um, whether that be, you know, brownies, cups, you know, all these, you know, um, good so good societies and good um, community groups that we have within Ford Cooper Angus. Excellent. That's great. So, yeah, exciting times reopening, but busy, I guess. Uh, that's great. Thank you. So, yeah, so promoting these, obviously, they're great and raise money for good causes as well and provide local employment and all of these things. So really try and stress that to people you know, and you can pick up a bargain. But also online, obviously, there's loads of options now. So eBay, Gumtree, local sales and wanted sites. Um, do you get those people who will not go into a charity shop for love nor money? They just don't like the whole idea of it. But they'll go into a vintage shop and pen pay 10 times more. Um, but hey, hope they're still getting second hand, so that's all good. Um, or there's also sometimes dress agencies. There's not that many of these around, but sometimes you'll get these shops where they will sell your clothes on commission on your behalf. So they tend to only take the really good quality stuff. So again, for the people who are a bit reluctant about second hand or want something a bit special, these stores might be really good for them. But I also stress the option of borrowing things. So you know, sometimes you don't need to buy it. So if you're going to do a, a job, you're going to sand a floor, why go and buy a sander, which you'll probably use then and maybe not use for another 20 years, and by which time it will stop working, it will rusted or whatever. So try to encourage people to think about borrowing things. So a friend, a neighbour may have something. But the tool libraries, there's loads of really good tool libraries. Now I've just highlighted one there, but again, if there's a local one to you, it's worth highlighting that. Um, but it's not just a tools you can hire. Um, a lot of these tool libraries, like Sterling Tool Library, I know have like a food dehydrator. So you get people saying, I want to start juicing or steaming things or dehydrating things. You say, well, yeah, go and borrow one, give it a try, because you might find you don't actually like it. So rather than people buying these gadgets and then using them once and getting rid of them, go and borrow it. Um, music broths, great musical instrument libraries. So again, if you've got a kid who says, oh, I want to take up the violin, um, but you're kind of a bit thinking, yeah, this is going to be a five minute wonder, go and borrow one rather than buy one. Um, but also clothes. The men will go and hire a kilt for an, for an special event but women tend to go and buy a dress and then maybe wear it once so trying to encourage people to start thinking about again borrowing or renting an outfit um look the options are a bit limited at the moment and tend to be quite high end but again it's it's something well worth thinking about um and so you know if you want to make this interactive you can have polls you could set up on here um or just open it up to a discussion and get people to say, you know, is there anything that people currently rent rather than buy? So let's just try this out on you guys. Is there anything that you guys regularly rent rather than buy or, or rent as a one-off? Anyone want to throw anything in? I might just throw something in there. I mean, this is many years ago when you used to be able to rent DVDs and, and videos, Blockbuster, Love Film, which is now Netflix. That I think that's the last time I rented anything. 
Yeah, yeah, that's a great example, Claire. So yeah, when you get people saying, oh, I never rent anything, then that is a really good example to throw out there and say you've done that. Well, Stuart's put his yeah. hand up. Yeah, I think you, you would rent many DIY tools, wouldn't you? So yeah. basically, you know, still saws, you know, drills, various pieces of equipment that are probably too expensive to buy, but reasonable to rent. So I think your idea around if you're going to set up a shop, um, whether that be a borrower shop, etc., then you do need to look at the present trends, don't you, really? Because, as you said, you know, things are faddy, aren't they? You know, yeah. let's all have this or, you know, I remember in the olden days, we used to have record cleaners, KTEL record cleaners. We used to think, why would you have a rec Why would you have a machine that cleans a record? But you all <laughs> had to have one or a buttoneer was another one that you used to have to have as well. So... <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So right about these fads. Yeah. So yeah, if we can encourage people to rent rather than buy, it's a kind of try before you buy thing as well. Or you might find that actually you're just not going to use it that often. So you really don't need to buy it. So obviously in line of the, the, oh, sorry, Tom, you phrased your hand as well. Hi, Tom. Hello there. <clears throat> no, I, I think, I think you're right as far as the weddings go, because, um, Tradition a good while ago was you had a, a big a suit, you know, it was before the, 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 the kilts were in fashion and everybody wore a kilt for their wedding. I was kind of pre-kilt, should have given away my age. But uh, you know, we always rent you always rented the suit for the day. And in weddings, I have always in the last when since I've been married, I've always rented a kilt when when it's required. Whereas my wife has always bought an outfit and I as as you were saying, I don't think she's ever worn it twice. It's not as if she says, that's my, <laughs> my, my wedding outfit. She's got to have something else. But that's that's maybe, a, that's maybe a, something that's going to take a wee bit longer to, get to, to change. Yeah, definitely. Totally agree. But hopefully she will go on to step two and she will donate those lovely dresses so that somebody else can reuse them. Um, so again, thinking about those reuse shops, those charity shops, um, I've mentioned the reuse line there. That's changed a little bit from anyone rem remembers what our reuse line used to be, but actually it's just an online directory of reuse shops that will come and pick large furniture items up um, from you. Um, but always worth checking those out. But also just potentially giving things to friends and family Offering them on free cycle and free goal, I found even if you've got something that's maybe slightly damaged or not working as well as it could do, if you put it on free cycle or free goal and say, look, this isn't working right, um, I don't want it anymore, but does anyone want it who's maybe got a bit of time to tinker with it? Often somebody will take it off your hands, so it is always worth offering things out there. Or of course these days you can sell items as well. Um, so I think at the moment, again, it's a good time to put the, the question out there, especially if you're running this in a confined area. So maybe you're just in sort of the south side of Glasgow or you're in Dundee or whatever, then getting people to talk about where is actually taking donations at the moment is a good sort of thing to, to do because a lot of people have had big decluttering sessions during lockdown and have got all this stuff and don't know where to take it. So worth having a chat on that one. I'll move on to the next one, swapping. And I know loads of you do really good swap shops, uh, but again, just making the public think about this. Swapping is a great thing to do. And we think about swap shops being mostly kind of clothes, but actually it could be so many different things. Could be jewelry, could be potato tubers, plants, seeds. I know a local group to me, Peebles Can, during lockdown did plant swaps and basically got people to put plants out on their um, front garden walls and then they made a map of where all the plants were and you could just do a walking tour and go around and pick up plants that you wanted so even in lockdown people have managed to do some of this stuff but it could be kitchen equipment books games all of these things but again maybe try and highlight some local examples so I think we've got at least four groups on here who do some really good swap shops. So you've got Shrub, Grant and Goes Greener, Revolve, Recycle, and Gate Church, um, who all do them in slightly different ways. Um, so I know Lindsay is on here, hopefully from Gate Church. 
Um, I see you've got one of your community wardrobes coming up. Soon. Yes. Um, yeah, we used to do a big swap, but with COVID, we decided to kind of do it a bit differently. So we started a community wardrobe where people can bring clothes, but they can also just take whatever. Um, and yeah, obviously it's there for people who need stuff as well. We, we get referrals from agencies for people who need certain things. So we're opening next Friday. It's open every Friday and the last Saturday of the month. So yeah, we're excited to get going again. Yeah. So how <laughs> does it work? When, when do people donate? Do they bring stuff on the day or is it in advance? Yeah, so normally on the day they just we've got a box at the door, they can just leave their stuff so we can leave that to isolate for a few days um, and then they can go in and take what they want. Um, because we're just reopening next Friday, we're going to open the day before as well in case we're expecting quite a lot to be donated. So we're, we're going to have a, um, yeah, an open day kind of thing. So stuff that's donated on the day doesn't get put out to be taken on the day. You save that for a, a future event. Yeah, in normal times we would, but we've we've come up with an isolation system to make sure that there's not too many different people handling it. So we'll keep that for the, the, the swap the week after and we'll, we'll put that stuff out then. Excellent. Yeah, thanks, Lindsay. That's great. And do we have someone on from Shrub? Do we have... Hello, yes. Hi. Hello. So are you still doing a swap shop at Shrub? Um, well, it's been closed since Christmas, but yes, we're excited to reopen again. We don't open on Monday, so on the 27th. So we're working towards that. Excellent. So how, how does your one work? Um, our one works on, a well, a cooperative membership kind of basis. So when someone is a member, they can bring in their things and then those items have like our volunteers go through them and apply tokens, like depending on the value of the items, what we're going to resell them for. And then they can use the tokens that are on their membership to get other things in the shop. And then people who aren't members can just come into the shop and buy things like a charity shop. Excellent. And it's open to everyone, isn't it? It's not just university students. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's all sorts of folks. And when you're a member, we have just a free rail all the time as well. Um, which is which is pretty cool because it just it means that the things that we might struggle to make sure go to a new home do it oh. yeah i think it disappeared <laughs> but yeah so if if you're in edinburgh um go and check out shrub uh, but yes, yeah, so, there's so many different ways to run swap shops and Revolve Recycle um, uh, have their, their permanent swap shops on the south side of Glasgow, where again, you can become a member. Um, so yeah, well worth checking these out and, and highlighting them to people as an option to think about. Um, because if, everybody loves to get something for free, um, but we're also all decluttering. So it's a really good way of pe getting people to do something that's environmentally friendly. I don't, maybe don't even think about the fact that it is environmentally friendly. It's just kind of a different way of shopping, really. Um, Okie dokie. Um, and I was just going to highlight this one, which I thought was quite nice from years ago, but Orkney Zero Waste did wanted to do a swap shop to involve the guys because so many swap shops are a bit girly focused and it tends to be a lot of women getting involved. So they did a tie swap. Um, but then the, the male focus kind of disappeared a little bit when they then had loads of leftover ties and they decide, were trying to decide what to do with them. And they made Barbie dresses and skirts and bags and all sorts of things. But I thought that was a lovely idea, really good fun and a bit different. Um, just you know, something different to do. Um, so again, get people chatting. Is there, has anyone had a really top swap that they they got something really good that they want to share? Nope. Well, there you go. That's that's your challenge for you. You got to find something good to swap. So. Okay, so the next one, upcycling. And again, I'm sure we've got some real good upcycling experts here. Lots of you have run workshops around this. But again, getting people to think about before they throw something out, could they actually do something with it? Um, I think the difficult thing with upcycling is always the fact that a lot of people will think, yeah, great, we're upcycling. It's really environmentally friendly. But in a lot of cases, 
they are upcycling something that is perfectly recyclable into something that is totally unrecyclable and is going to end up in landfill. So I always kind of try and stress that little caveat. And I know we did a little competition recently with schools where they had to create a mascot um, from recyclable items. But part of the remit was that they couldn't put anything in there that made it unrecyclable. So they couldn't use glue, they couldn't use sellotape and all of this stuff. So if, if you're having little upcycling competitions, it's sometimes worth thinking about just building in those sort of bits. Um, but if you can get people to do things like turning trousers into draft excluders, then that kind of does two things. It reuses the trousers, but then it's also going to make your home more energy efficient. So that's quite a nice one to do. Um, and I know loads of people have run furniture upcycling workshops, and those are brilliant. Um, and they're also a good way to get the kids involved and all the arts and crafts stuff, lots of really good creative things. And can be very practical as well and money saving and waste saving. So this is just an example um, from my husband runs a self catering business and when he took it over, the kitchen was the top picture. So it was pretty drab, it was pretty outdated. And I don't know if you can see, but there's like a, a red towel covering one of the gaps and basically two of the doors were completely missing on this kitchen. Um, and he was struggling to find new doors that matched the rest of the stuff. But actually in the end, he decided that he wanted to give it a revamp anyway. We found a company in Edinburgh that came down, took all the doors off, um, took them away, um, they uh, repainted them, put it all back together. Um, because they were painting stuff, it was easier to find doors that matched everything else and completely revamped this kitchen. Um, and I hope you agree, it looks completely different for a fraction of the price and with no waste. Um, and when I send the slides out, actually, if anybody wants the name of the companies that do any of the things I mentioned, I've put the, a link to the company in the notes um, section. Uh, but that is a really practical bit of upcycling. And so again, you could throw this out to the group. Uh, have you upcycled anything? So again, uh, has anyone got a, a really good upcycling project they're really proud of they want to just mention? Um, I've done quite a few things when I, when I bought my house. Uh, I, most of the furniture is upcycled. My favourite thing is a bureau that my mum had from when I was really little and she didn't want it anymore. She was going to give it away, but I, I made it, you know, sit my house and painted it and everything. So, yeah, it's just you can you can just do so many different things with it and make it suit your style. So I like it. Love it. Is that one of those old fashioned bureaus where you pull the, the top down? It's <laughs> death. You bring it top down. I've, I've like put nice little scraps of wallpaper in the back. So there's like interesting things inside as well. Fantastic. Yeah, there's some really good stuff out there. So yeah, de definitely worth having a look. And then you can you can go and pick something up at your reuse shop for an absolute bargain price and turn it into a work of art. Also for anyone that lives in the, the Stirling area, there's a, a place in um, a small village called Fulin that does um, upcycling stuff. So you can send them your furniture or they can pick it up and they can upcycle it. Um, so say you've got a broken piece of furniture, they can fix it and make it look really, really funky. So that's just another example. Oh, excellent. Maybe you can send out a link to that. I oh, will do, yep. Sounds good. Excellent. So moving on to repair. Again, this is a real lost art and trying to get people to think about repairing things. I think the natural instinct these days is just to throw things out. Um, so really try and stress repair. For clothing, there's loads of really good online things that like Love Your Clothes has some really good things on there. And there's a, a Scottish um, one called Repair What You Wear that has, again, lots of good videos and things. For electronics, um, ifixit.com is a really good resource. Um, for other things, often it can be a, a bit more complicated. But yeah, if it's something you're regularly repairing, then maybe it's worth learning the skills yourself. So for example, with bikes, um, well worth learning a bit of bike maintenance. Or you can go to places like um, oh, Bike for Good, where they, maybe not at the moment, I don't know necessarily, but in normal times, you can go in and they'll have sort of fixing times. You can go in and you can use their tools, but there's also somebody nearby to help if you get stuck and need a bit of help. 
Um, repair cafes are amazing. Um, you can go along and they will have volunteers who will help fix your items. The idea is ideally they show you how to fix it and you learn how to fix it. Um, but obviously it depends how complicated things are and if you need the right tools to do it. Um, and some places like um, Transition Sterling will actually repair things for you for a small fee if you don't want to go to a repair cafe. Um, and I don't know if we've got the people from the general store in Selkirk here. Um, I don't think so, Miriam. I haven't oh. taken them off. Ah, oh, that's a shame. Yeah, Susan and Dorothy were both signed up. Yeah. Um, but that's a, a kind of new one that they're just setting up to do repair. So I was interested to see what they're what they're doing. Um, but also, I think a really good thing to do if you're a community group or whatever is stressing where things can get repaired in your area. So both Changeworks and Greener Kokodi have made really good maps, online maps, where you can find local reuse and repair facilities. Um, so I don't, have we got anyone on from Changeworks? I think Fidra was here. Hello. Hello. Hi, is that Fidra? Um, yeah, it's great for you to mention our map. Yeah, there's a lot of work went into it there and to try and think about reusing and repairing and giving people options to make them think about what's possible for them. So appreciate that shout out. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, no, I think a lot of work goes into these things, isn't it? Yeah, um, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Have you had much feedback from it? I don't know if uh, Ruth's uh, Ruth, um, she actually was a project lead, Sorry, but unfortunately yeah, yeah. there's a problem. <laughs> oh, my uh, my <laughs> that internet stopped working the moment the map was mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> Typical. Uh, your uh, moment the same. Anyway. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we have the Edinburgh Reuse Map, which is on the Changeworks website, and um, it's now got over 450 organisations on it that all off kind of offer wow. Um, either repair services or secondhand or places that you can donate so we've got kind of give get fix button so you kind of work through the categories to find um, <clears throat> what you're looking for in terms of what you're looking to buy or fix or donate um, and then it just gives you a list of options with a map so you can also see which ones are nearby to you as well um, so we are going to be actually doing um, some campaigning over the next week because obviously a lot of the stores have been closed or unable to run most of their services um, since we launched in December so next week's really exciting for us so we can kind of get people out there and using the map as much as possible which is really great. Wow 450 organizations. I that think it's is... around 450 and we've got another 30 to add so we're hoping to get to 500 that's my that's my target. <laughs> wow yeah that's quite an undertaking. So are you having to maintain it or? So um, we do a bit of maintenance. So we'll do kind of spot checks and things, um, but there are features on the map. So organizations or members of the public can edit the data. So then we just kind of go in and double check that it's right. So at the moment we're asking everyone to go in and double check their opening times because obviously they may well be changing given the restrictions easing. Um, so we do a, we do a certain level of maintenance, but it's also kind of, you know, we want people to be engaging with it and updating it themselves. And we want organizations to be, um, you know, proud to be on the map and making sure that the information on there is accurate as well. I think that is a really good point because we've tried to, as Zero Way Scotland, we've had various things on our website where we've tried to sort of have lists of what can be recycled in your area and things like that. But it's the maintenance that is the nightmare and keeping everything up to date. So if you can try and put the onus on the public or the organisation, exactly. uh, that's yeah. a really good tip. Yeah, yeah, and I think that people feel more invested in it, then they're more likely to kind of use it as a resource as well. So I think it works both in both ways. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Um, no well done for that. That is absolutely brilliant. So yeah, when you get the slides, you'll get links to all these things. But it's worth having a look at those. Um, and I say, if you can build up a kind of a local sort of database or something to help direct people locally to reusing and repairing things more it's going to make it so much easier because people just don't know what facilities are out there and um, so if you can make it as easy as possible that's a really good thing to do the last one i mentioned on there is 3d printing um, and again this is a, a sort of fairly new kind of offering i think that people don't think about um, but can be invaluable. So I know like years ago, I had a food processor I loved 
and the sort of plastic spindle in the middle broke. And I called the company, they couldn't replace it. I tried asking online, I tried all sorts of different things. I just could not replace it. And I had to throw away this food processor just because of this one bit of plastic, which was so annoying. And anyone that's got a food processor knows there's so many bits to them now. You know, you've got all the different slicing tools for different vegetables and all this sort of paraphernalia. And for the sake of one bit of plastic, it all ended up going into the bin. Um, but now I could have gone to Transition Sterling, I could have given them that and they could have 3D printed a replacement for that, which would have saved an awful lot of waste and a lot of money me having to get something to replace that. Um, so again, well worth thinking about 3D printing if you can do that. Um, and I was just going to stress another sort of repair project my husband did. I was well proud of him for this one. But again, when he got this business, the cooker, kind of just about seeing the picture on the left, you've got the, the hob and the dials, but there's no numbers or symbols on there. It had all worn off, which meant you didn't know what was hot, what was cold. Um, on the other dials, you can see what was the oven, what was the grill, all of this sort of stuff. So it kind of made the oven pretty unusable. Um, but he found a company online that you can give them the make and the model of the oven, and they will send you the set of stickers and the instructions for what goes where. So the pictures, the top right is his hairy hand stick, putting his little stickers on, and the bottom one is sort of the, the finished thing after he put his stickers on. But it has saved a whole oven going into landfill for the sake of recycling for the sake of just some stickers so that's a really really simple one but again i get i bet most of us wouldn't have even thought of that we were just saying oh god i'm gonna have to get rid of this oven that is useless um so that was a great one again i've put the the link in the um the notes on here um, so again just throw it out there anyone got a, a real top repair job they did that they're really proud of Well, I guess it's not me that repaired it, but um, my MacBook broke down last year and I didn't want to replace it. It's pretty expensive. Um, have insurance got it sent away and it was just the hard drive that was needing replaced. So I could have ended up buying an expensive new laptop if I didn't want to get it repaired and it was repaired and it works perfectly like, like brand new. So, and it's, ten, it's 10 years old, so. That's great. Yeah, I bet there's not many MacBooks out there 10 years old. So well done. Yeah. So that's great. Well, we've got Lorette with her hand up. Hi. Hello. Hi. Yeah, I have a, a exercise bike. And um, I had it for a couple of years now. And uh, it started making a hell of a lot of noise. And it's not an expensive one. So originally, I would have thought, well, I'm just going to buy a new one. You know, because well, I use it a lot. And then I thought, it's a, re it's a re Reebok. So I thought, I'm just going to email Reebok and see what they say. And I emailed them, and they actually got in touch. And they sent a technician, and they set a part. And he fixed it for free. For free? Mm -hmm. wow. because, because although I didn't, have the, I didn't have the paperwork for the bike, they said, well, it's too early. You only had it for such, like less than two years. It shouldn't break. Wow. So I would recommend people to always email the company just in case. You know, you never know. I, yeah. To be honest, I thought, you know, it's less than two years old, but it's cheap, you know, cheap ash. You could just buy a new one. But I thought, I'm just going to gonna try, email them and see what they say. And they were like, oh, no, no, it's less than two years. We'll send someone. So they actually sent, the, they made me take a video of it, of the noise it was making. Yeah. And they sent the the part to my house and then they send the technician to fix it. That's it was amazing. amazing. I was actually in shock. I didn't pay any, anything for it. And I have, <laughs> it's been going on for three years now. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's a great story. So I will yeah. always try to contact yeah. the company and see what they say, because yeah. they might have something that they can offer. Yeah. And it's good customer service, isn't it? From oh, yeah, no. Business. If I buy another one in the future, I'll buy Reebok again. Yeah, <laughs> they definitely. want me. That's me. Yeah. Well, I had a pair of shoes where the whole sole fell off. 
Um, and I took it to Timpsons to, to repair. And they said, they're really not sure if we can repair it or not, if it's gonna last. So they repaired it, but again, they did it for free. They didn't charge me because they said, you know, if, if it didn't work, then you know, that, that would kind of be a bit, bit pants really for customer service or whatever. So they just did it for free. So it's, it's always worth trying, always worth asking these things. The last one I'm going to stress was avoiding single use items. Um, and this is very much we stress single use items, not plastic. I'm sure you've all heard all the backlash against plastic. Everybody hates plastic. And they're going out and getting compostable, biodegradable, all these different options. But actually, most of the time, that stuff still ends up in landfill and is no better than plastic. So we're really trying to stress it is single use. So just getting people to think about a lot of the things. Carrier bags, I think, are an obvious one. People, especially because they're now charged, um, will start to use bags for life. Um, but cling film and silver foil, try and stress that you know, those are not great options. Um, if you use Tupperware instead, or just putting a plate on top of things, all that sort of stuff. Um, obviously, um, beeswax wraps have been really popular, which I think are great, but they're not as durable as, clean, as um, Tupperware. So personally, I've had Tupperware for like 20 years, so I will continue to use that. And yet, yeah, it might be plastic, but plastic is durable. It is lightweight. It is really practical. So that's great. Trying to avoid the paper plates and the plastic cutlery um, and or bamboo cutlery or whatever the cutlery is made of. You know, if you've got a drawer full of cutlery, that's always going to be the best option. Um, avoiding the kitchen roll and the tissues as much as possible. So you know, we now have proper, proper material napkins at the dinner table, which we didn't do for years. Um, I'm trying to get my husband to actually use his, it's another matter, but um, just trying to avoid the disposables. Trying to avoid the wet wipes, but also stressing that if you do have wet wipes, whatever it says, even if it says it's biodegradable, do not flush it down the toilet. Um, take away coffee cups. See, during lockdown, a lot of cafes have got a bit nervous about this and are only giving takeaway coffee cups, not accepting the reusable ones. But trying to stress them that actually a reusable one could be safer if they manage it properly. And there's videos online with coffee shops demonstrating how to do this in really safe ways. So, for example, if you go into a coffee shop with your reusable coffee cup, if you put that into one of their mugs, they could then take hold of the mug, take the mug over to the coffee machine, fill up your coffee, give it back to you, you take your coffee cup out. And so actually neither of you has touched the same cup, which is actually safer than them giving you a takeaway coffee cup. Um, so there are ways to do these things, but I just need to remind people. Plastic straws, again, there's been a bit, a lot of stuff here. People are buying bamboo straws, metal straws, pasta straws, all sorts of different straws. But actually, if you can avoid using a straw full stop, then that's going to be the best option. Obviously, that's not possible for everybody. There are exceptions where people need straws. But ideally, if you can avoid it, that's great. And the last one we've been pushing, which we did a big campaign on a couple of years ago, but a lot of people with menstrual products have just always used what their mothers told them to use when they were 13, 14 or whatever. Um, so they're using tampons, they're using disposable pads. Um, and so we're trying to stress that there are options as moon cups, reusable pads, period pants, all of these things. They haven't been readily available in the past. You haven't been able to, for example, walk into Sainsbury's and get these things. Um, and so they've not been at the forefront of people's minds and often people haven't even considered them. So again, we've done a lot of work just trying to, to promote that these things exist. Um, and we can run workshops about that as well if anybody wants those. So just trying to get the word out there. Um, so I'm conscious of time. So I will whiz on to the finish. But yeah, again, something you might want to do is get people to pledge something that they're going to do differently so something that they could reuse that they normally throw away or recycle or whatever something they could do to reduce waste 
Um, and I put some links on here at the end. There's my contact details. There's our, um, our consumer website and social media channels. There is also Instagram, actually, which I haven't put on there. Um, and there is a page about some of the community group support that we offer. So, for example, workshops like this, um, if you've got 12 or more people, we can run workshops about reuse, about love your clothes, about love food, hate waste, about reusable menstrual products, um, about reducing single use items, various things like that. And that's all on the link. Um, and there are also some downloadable resources and things on there. There's leaflets, all that sort of stuff. So I'll stop sharing so I can all see each other again.